Welcome to New York Augmented Reality. It's great to have you all back and nice to see a bunch of familiar faces here. Jason, it's so nice to see you. Andrew, great to see you. Barack, I'm glad you're here again. As the industry uh, continues to grow rapidly, our group continues to expand as well. So we have a big increase from zero members only a couple months ago now to over 600, which is super exciting. So we get about 100 new members every event and we uh, keep rolling them out. And thank you all for, for consistently joining us for all of our meetups. Uh, we have an incredible lineup and I'm uh, really excited to introduce the speakers soon. And if you see anyone in the chat that you're interested in uh, speaking with, feel free to just send them a private message as well. And I really appreciate you taking the time to be here tonight and giving back to uh, augmented reality and uh, being interested in meeting others in the space, uh, just as I am. So once again, this is a meetup, so don't hesitate to reach out to one another, exchange hellos, and send your regards, share contact information in the chat. The chat's uh, free for you to post in at any point. And uh, before getting started, I see Andrew Deutsch here. He is the founder of the AR Kit New York City meetup, and he's had me on before to share about my meetup. So just want to share the uh, invitation to him. And Andrew, if you'd like to say a few words, you're more than welcome. Just like send me a message and uh, you can hop on at any point. Um, sweet. Jason, hope you're doing good. It's so good to see you. Um, so getting right into it. No problem, Andrew. Uh, you're always welcome here. I'm so happy you're here. So Snap released a pair of AR spectacles and uh, this is a preview of uh, the UX that's controlled via touch gestures on the side of the glasses. The glasses only have a 26.3 degree field of view. That's about half of the HoloLens too and the battery life only lasts 30 minutes and it's intended for developers as the device is not even for sale and it's invitation only. So if you wanted to try on the glasses yourself, you could scan this code. I don't, I'll leave it on for like 10 seconds if you wanted to like scan it and then you can just get a better idea of the form factor uh, of the device. So it uh, looks like on the video, no one has their phone out and scanning. So I will progress that. Um, uh, Snap also announced connected lenses, which can be uh, developed through Snap Studio, and you can find out more about it in the documentation. Snap also purchased uh, the uh, Wave Optics, their optical supplier, their spectacles uh, this past week. So they've been uh, making a lot of progress in the space, and I thought this was a really nice uh, video of connected len lenses and their partnership with Lego. So that's really cool. Uh, Niantic released the Lightship ARDK, giving developers access to AR with the same tools that power Pokemon Go and Ingress. So uh, within the ARDK, you are able to um, have access to their real world mapping capabilities. You have access to their um, uh, real large scale multiplayer. And you also have access to semantic uh, segmentation, which allows you to properly recognize and include real world objects without having to be such an expert in computer vision. So uh, that could, it could be really interesting to see what developers come up with with this new SDK. Um, also this past, past month, Oscar Salandin, hopefully we could have him in a future meetup, released Touching Holograms along with Microsoft, um, where he discovered that holding a bright object and casting light through your hand can give you more feedback between the object you're interacting with in AR and some of the other senses besides for what the HoloLens is capable of. So since the HoloLens doesn't support the sense of touch um, and people can't feel the holograms, um, uh, Oscar uh, uh, hypothesized that holding a, uh, a glowing hologram and seeing its effects um, will actually emulate the sense of touch and uh, provide for more immersive augmented reality experiences. Uh, and then I thought this was really cool. So uh, brothers, uh, Christoph and Matthew Louise helped, held their first real world flight simulator, which used augmented reality. So uh, 
Christoph is a research scientist in mixed reality at Stanford, and his brother is a flight simulator player. So on the right, you could see, um, on the right, you could see his brother Matthew flying on the simulator, and on the left, Christoph's viewing it in augmented reality using map positioning and AR kit landing on the Stanford campus. So it's really interesting how those are working together. And it, it shows you the potential of where augmented reality uh, can take us in the near future. So that's really cool. And without further ado, I have Sunak Goshir. He's going to do a uh, case study on his app Freehand Assistant, which is uh, a, uh, a really interesting uh, uh, study on the haptics, um, on the uh, sense of touch through mixed reality and Sunak's a 3D designer and mixed reality prototype prototyper and he's currently pursuing a master's degree in technology, media and culture at New York University. So I'm excited to have him be here with us to share this month's app spotlight free hand assistant. So Sunak, feel free to share your screen and take it from here. Awesome, thank you Andy for having me. Thanks everyone. Um, I am going to quickly try to share my screen. Yes. All right, so thank you, Andy, for already introducing me. You kind of saved me some time there. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Shanak. I'm a 3D designer, interactive prototyper, currently doing a master's at NYU. Um, in technology, media, and culture. Um, one of the projects I've been working on is Freehand Assistant, and it's the one I'm gonna to share today. Um, it's a voice and gaze controlled hand assistant um, in XR. So it kind of focuses on enabling people who have hand disabilities. Um, and um, I'm kind of focusing this on for um, AR glasses and kind of headset based um, system, which would use hands as a main part of their interaction. So the Holdens do magic leap, you know, Apple's new glasses or Facebook's new glasses, and real, you know, all of them, Snap. Um, this would be applicable for all of them. Um, why is this important? You know, one out of 50 people have, um, in the US, have limb paralysis. That's like 5.4 uh, 5 million people. And 2 million people are amputees. Um, that's roughly 7.4 million people just in the US um, that cannot use these technologies to their full capacity in the, um, in the enterprise sector, so they're being deployed. And it doesn't have to be just people with disabilities. I mean, if someone has a temporary disability, like an injury, a fracture, you know, this, this still holds true. Um, they would need something like this to um, not lose their productivity using these technologies. It could be a situational or task-based you know, necessity where um, you, know, you need both your hands to do a work and you can't hold controllers or you can't use hand tracking. Um, for a particular case. And I'm focusing this on enterprise, I'm focusing this for uh, training similar scenarios for client demos, for visualization, um, that kind of purposes. Uh, when I started doing this um, research, I was uh, kind of, I started interviewing people both in the disabilities community and the developers and designers who work with this. And some of the key insights that I kind of got from this was um, like three, three main points actually. So one was device use. A lot of assistive technology uses um, additional hardware that you have to kind of combine. That maybe they're joysticks or some kind of stuff. Um, but these can be expensive, and uh, a lot of disability community folks were kind of against this, and they were like, "This needs more setup. Um, it's a kind of a barrier to entry." There are also some tech technical challenges, like you said. You know, you can't feel. There's no haptics. Um, yeah, hand physics aren't there, so you, you, it's hard to kind of create proper grip poses and um, believable weight of grabbing objects. And um, it's getting better, but some companies who are focused on the, the training side might not develop um, or have the resources to develop all these nuanced hand physics. Um, and also, we need to account for user expectations. You know, hand movements can be imprecise. Um, you can have tracking errors and this reduces the experience quite a bit. Um, so I kind of took most of HoloLens 2's case studies um, and their training scenarios for my ideation process. And three key functionalities that I kind of wanted to incorporate was step-by-step -step instructions, 
a point and click functionality and teleportation movement, which is important because you're kind of spatially oriented and you don't you want to account for what kind of space the user is in and have um, some of the interesting things of incorporating a voice. You know, this is a voice assistant. And just to give a better background, it's like if anybody remembers Adam's family, there was this character called the thing and there's a hand just walking around. It's like that. It's like a hand within your space. It kind of helps you out to do tasks in the virtual space. Um, and one of the key ways of communicating with this hand is using voice. Um, so people kind of look at an object before they interact. And this is one of the main things I found out while testing. Um, so gaze actually signifies the intention of the person. And this is not uh, the same as a voice assistant because um, you expect your hand to share the same mind as you. You don't expect your hand to react differently. So when you're looking at something, you already know what the hand is supposed to be looking at. Um, some of the initial ske sketches of how this assistant could look like, would it have wings um, and all that. Um, I kind of simulated this, I'll play this video shortly. Um, so I kind of attached a laser uh, pointer to my head and um, put the phone, uh, attached the phone to the mask and it's kind of simulated the simulation before building it just to test how the flow was going. And there were some very interesting things I found. Uh, I was able to um, take out some of the assumptions that I had in, in the starting process. Um, and uh, you know, when I say open and open, I say put down and it puts down the tools. So this is kind of simulating the whole user flow. And then I went on and built the wireframes for it. So how the onboarding would be, how the teleportation and the learning process would be, how you would go through a step-by-step -step training. Um, and I uh, made these wireframes that I was able to test with a few people just to get a better, clearer picture. Um, once I have all this down, I, I started making the interactions. So now how grabbing look like and what kind of feedback do you receive from the system? So you see the hands are just floating um, in front of you and um, you can say grab or pick up and it kind of picks it up. Um, it's also locomotion and how you teleport. And you can see the hand has different icons that uh, give you the feedback necessary that, oh, I don't understand what voice command you just use or I'm not listening to you right now. So that was, I think, a very important part of um, any voice UI, to be um, honest. So that was the gist of it. Um, what's next is more usability testing. Uh, I would like to expand the functionality of this um, to more scenarios and see where the gaps are. And um, also natural language processing. This, this is a voice interface. So it was very interesting to see what are the different words people use to interact with different kinds of objects. Um, you would say grab that or pick up that or pull that. So there are different words associated with it. Um, with the object. And one of the key things was when we think of disabilities or diverse abilities, it doesn't have to be a limiting factor. In fact, it can enable us to think more, co more cognitive capacity um, that we have it can enable us to discover superpowers. Like what would, how would we control multiple hands, not just two in, in these environments using our voice and gaze. So that was just a question for the future. Let's see where this can go. Um, but yeah, if you, like this project if you're interested um to chat feel free to check out i'll share this link with you in the chat so anyone who's interested to kind of go through this presentation again can awesome thank you Shinak. that was a uh, that was awesome and uh feel free to share your contact info in the chat and if you'd like to continue conversations uh feel free to reach out with any folks um in zoom meeting uh, next up, we have Rish Lotlicker with his uh, website, Superworld. He is the co-founder and CEO of Superworld, and it's a place to create and discover AR content and buy and sell virtual real estate. Um, and it's pretty timely because today they were just featured on the uh, New York Times as well. So it's a, a pleasure to have you here. Feel free to uh, take it from here. Hey, hey everyone. Um, I just thought I would drop in today, say hello. It's a really nice group of people you have here. So pleasure to meet all of you. Um, uh, you know, I'm uh, love to, uh, you know, be in touch and such. So um, looking forward to kind of uh, meeting you today and, and being back and then more so just getting to know you all. Um, I'll, I'll start by just kind of giving you um, a high level um, 
uh, a bit about uh, Superworld and kind of what our, our vision is um, and, you know, kind of talk through some of the products that we have uh, currently and kind of what we're working on. So high level vision is, you know, about uh, four years ago, we saw, you know, Pokemon Go come out and become this huge sensation. And, you know, I got together with my co-founder, Max Woon back then and about four years ago and thought, you know what, what if we could build a, a world? What if we could build a platform for the next, you know, thousand Pokemon Go's get built on top of it. And so that was kind of the high level vision of Superworld. It's a, it's an augmented reality world. Um, everyone has their own world or filter on top of the real world. So there could be an infinite number of filters, right? I have a world, you have a world, brands have worlds. Um, the second part of the analogy is Foursquare. So lots of data. On the data side, you know, we're really, really, really focused on how do we improve people's real lives. Um, so first of all, anyone using Superworld earns crypto for doing anything in Superworld. Secondly, anything you do in Superworld benefits the real world. So as an example, we're planting a tree for anyone who buys virtual land in Superworld. Um, this month, but that's gonna enlarge beyond that. So there's gonna be lots of stuff that's gonna happen to the real world every time you do stuff in Superworld. So again, high level vision of Superworld is how can we improve people's lives and how can we improve the real world? And data is a big part of that. And that's permissioned use of data, data monetization for users, you know, uh, data sovereignty, data integrity. Um, and then the third part of Superworld is monopoly. So we've divided the surface of the earth into 64 billion digital blocks. These are structured as NFTs on the Ethereum blockchain. We're blockchain agnostic, we're interoperable. Um, and so again, uh, if you buy a block of virtual land, about a city block of land, you get a share of any of the economics that happen there in any of the infinite number of worlds that can exist on that land. So my world, your world, Coca-Cola's world, Nike's world, any of those filters, if you own Central Park, you're getting a share of all of that yeah, commerce. Uh, again, digital commerce, e-commerce, gaming, you know, transactions, advertising, anything that we can attribute to revenue. Um, and, uh, you know, so unlike Facebook and Google, you can actually buy Superworld, you can own Superworld, you can sell Superworld. And, and then on top of that, we're building applications. So we have a mobile application that's in open beta right now. Um, if there's people here in this group that would love to, you know, work on, work on Unity, I'm happy to talk to you about, um, you know, how, working with us, joining our team. Um, and, uh, you know, the, again, the, the mobile app, um, we're still in open beta right now, but it's basically allowing anyone to create, discover, and monetize anything anywhere, including NFTs. Um, and then we're um, this week launching a, a full NFT marketplace. So anyone can create digital assets out of any file type and then put them into augmented reality, into Superworld. And then we're also building a developer API so other apps can build on top of Superworld. And we're moving into tokenization and DeFi as well, um, all within uh, the next about eight weeks. So lots of stuff happening, but that's kind of the high level on Superworld. Incredible, really love what you guys are working on and excited to see where the future holds. So thanks for hopping on. Hopefully we can have you uh, for even a larger uh, uh, portion uh, in a future meetup. So thanks. So yeah, much. thanks, thanks. And I'm on LinkedIn, so look me up. Uh, you know, look up Superworld, right? My LinkedIn's right on the website. Uh, hit me up if you guys want to talk. I'm always, I'm really open. So love this group and would love to get to know you guys individually. So definitely reach out. Awesome. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Sweet. See ya. Cool. Thanks guys. So, so it's a bit of a process. Okay, um, now we'll move on to some presentations, which is super exciting. So we'll start out with Amal Ghosh, the Chief Operating Officer at Imagine Corporation. He's going to be speaking about how Imagine is making AR and VR a reality. Alex Brott is going to give us an overview of Mousepack and some of the latest projects that he's working on. And then Chuck Alger 
is going to give us an overview of Kura and what makes their pro what makes their product special. And then lastly, we're going to close out with an open forum with Roni Abovitz, who is joining us here for an open panel and forum. So please prepare any questions you have in advance so you'll get the chance to ask him during the panel. Now, without further ado, we have Dr. Amal Goshir. He's the Chief Operating Officer at Imagine Corporation. Prior to Imagine, he was employed at IBM Thomas Watson Research Center and Eastman Kodak Company. He has held numerous positions at Society for Information Displays over the course of 30 years, including being the president of SID during 2014 through 2016. Dr. Ghosh is considered a pioneer in the field of OLED on silicone micro displays. He is a fellow of SID. He has received numerous awards and recognitions for his work, including SIDS Carl's Ferdinand Braun Prize, SIDS Special Recognition Award, Mid-Atlantic Chapter Award, and the Korean Information Display Society's Special Recognition Award. Dr. Ghosh received a PhD degree in physics from Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts. If I ever had a resume like that, I would just stop working. <laughs> Dr. Ghosh, please feel free to share your screen and take it away from here. Thank you, Andy. That's quite flattering. Thank you. Um, okay. so what am I doing wrong here? Just give me a second. <laughs> we see you. Yes. Can you see me? See the screen? Yep, looks good. Okay, I'll just if I make it okay, now better. Presentation. Oh yeah, you're there. Okay. Okay, good evening everyone. And I really want to thank uh, uh, Barry Seff and Andy for organizing this and inviting me over to speak tonight. So I have a few slides, but I will try to go as fast as I can because I know there is a time limit. So I'm going to talk about uh, OLED on silicon micro displays, and I'm with Imagine Corporation. Uh, just one second, this I gotta move out. Okay. So the first question is, who who are we? Who is Imagine? Now we are a company located um, slightly upstate from New York City, about 70 miles north, and we are located in Hopewell Junction, New York, and we are located inside of the old IBM East Fishkill facility. And we have been in business since 1993. We started off with field emission displays. And then in 1997, we started developing OLED micro displays. We shipped our first product in 2002. And we are in production since then for almost 20 years now. We are a publicly traded company. We are uh, listed in the Amex uh, since 2000. Uh, this is just a variety of applications that our displays go into, um, starting from defense, which is our largest market uh, at the moment, but it goes all the way to entertainment and uh, in between there are medical and workstations and communications and all kinds of things. Um, these are some of the devices that are out there in the market and I will skip this quickly. I'll try to go fast. The display market size I wanted to share with you. If you look at the right chart, you can see that the blue is VR and pass through AR. Pass through is basically through a camera, and the gray is see through AR. So you can see that uh, it's a very rising trend there in terms of revenue. And by 2026, the revenue will be around $4.2 billion. On the left side, the chart shows uh, various technologies, but if you look at the green portion of the chart, that is the OLED on silicon micro displays actually. And that will be very big. It will capture the largest share of shipments uh, from 2025 onwards. So it's a big market actually. And this, this uh, source was DSCC. Uh, these are some of the displays that we have today as products, and I, it's absolutely not a complete uh, product uh, plat platform here, but this is a few of them. 
So I'll just talk a little bit on the right side, which is the WUXGA 1920 by 1200, slightly larger than um, uh, HD. This is a 0 0.87 inch diagonal display. It has a pixel pitch of 9.6 microns and the sub pixel pitch is 3.2 microns. And you can see the pictures are at the bottom compared to a US quarter, the size of the displays you can take a look at. Uh, this is just to show that uh, these are all done on a silicon wafer, eight inch silicon wafer right now. And uh, if you compare it with a large substrate television screen of 65 inches, it's uh, humongous compared to ours. This is a cross section, a kind of a cartoon cross section of what our devices are made of. Uh, the bottom part is all silicon, uh, it's CMOS circuitry, and you see a gray uh, region, uh, gray bar here, that is the via that goes up to the top surface. And then the dark uh, horizontal uh, line here, that is magnified under the lens here. Then onwards, we do it, and that's the anode that is there. And that anode has two functions, one is to inject holes, of course, and the other one needs to be uh, very high deflective uh, material because the light has to go upwards, not it cannot go through the silicon. The rest of the layers are all organic layers and our white OLED actually has two components. One produces blue green, the other one produces orange red. And then we have all the other layers. And finally, the seal layer in white here, that seal layer is very thin and it is very robust and it withstands the color filter process, which is done three times by photolithography. And that's directly on top of the seal. And as you know, that OLEDs are extremely sensitive to moisture and oxygen. And so that seal works very well. And there's a reason why these, all these have to be very thin because if the dimensions are so small for micro displays, you will get optical crosstalk if you, if you don't have them too thin. Okay, and today we have brightness up to 3000 nits and this does not include any tandem architecture or micro lens or any other things. So this is straight single unit, we can reach up to 3000 nits with this technology of white with color filters. Uh, this slide shows you just a process we follow. We actually designed the CMOS circuitry in-house and this taped out to the foundry. The foundry then uh, fabricates and gives us the wafers. And from anode patterning onwards, uh, we do the process here. So if you look at this box, the vertical line in the yellow font is all inside a clean room. And then the, the next step is not inside clean room, but these two are all at the wafer level, full wafer level. On the right side, the blue part is at the display level where we actually singulate the displays uh, into individual uh, pieces. So the next slide is a picture of our OLED deposition system. And you can see it's uh, the, there's a person there. It's a pretty big uh, machine. It has eight chambers and then there is a cluster. I mean, it is a cluster, but it has a large uh, central robot in there. On the right side, I'm showing a class 10 clean room. That's where most of our processing is done. And the reason we need such a high class clean room is the displays are so small. Uh, what that means is the defect level of tolerance is also very small. So to in order, order to uh, meet the specifications, uh, that the customers require, we have to be extremely clean in our processing. Uh, so the next slide, I'm showing four main <clears throat> um, uh, items that actually make the AR VR business. And of course, displays is one of the key components of it. And optics is a major one and content. And finally, price always is there. So all these things have to come together to make it a successful business. And I will only focus on the displays tonight, of course. These are some of the key requirements for AR, VR. Uh, there, many of these items are for VR, but AR also is uh, part of it. Uh, so angular resolution to the eye, field of view probably is mostly for VR. AR probably is less in, in that extent. Uh, no screen door effects, fast speed, no motion artifacts, contrast is high. Brightness, this is the key part and realistic color. 
Here I show you, this is for VR only, just a quick touch on that. The central green portion is which is of interest, which is the current sweet spot. And what that means is that there's a compromise or trade-off with various aspects. Uh, for example, the human eye resolution, that's very important. And it's typically one arc minute. And so to get to that one arc minute, you have to do a lot of things. And if you look at the right column, it is like 9,000 PPI and or the display size is very large and things like that. So we think that the sweet spot is manufacturable today uh, and it is doable. So that's for the VR. And one more consideration for VR is, as I mentioned, motion artifacts. In order to remove the motion artifact, people use what is known as persistence. And so that poses a, um, it poses a limit or rather a requirement on the display brightness. So here, if you assume that the display at the eye is about 150 nits, and if you assume that the optics efficiency for a very good optic has to be uh, very low, typically that's what I've seen at least. So if you take 10% optic efficiency and a 10% duty cycle, which is also very, very desired in VR, you get a brightness at the display level of 15,000 nits. So most people used to think that VR doesn't need high brightness, but VR also needs high brightness in order to satisfy these conditions. Okay, AR, of course, you know that you need very high brightness because you typically fight with the ambient. And here you would like a little more higher brightness coming to the eye, like 500 nits. And again, if you apply these conditions I just mentioned, you can go up to 50,000 nits requirement. So there is, the bottom line is that, okay, uh, bottom line is that there is uh, the requirement for, requirement for high brightness, no matter whether you are in AR or VR. And that's the key message I want to convey tonight. Um, th this is another example of if you don't have a very high uh, density display, you get screen door effects. And our displays are pretty high density. So 2645 PPI in this case, and this was a typical cell phone and it's only 600 or less PPI. So that's what you get. The, the screen door effect comes from the dead space between the subpixels. So the takeaway message is that you need a very high resolution, high brightness, high contrast micro display for success for both of AR and VR. And we believe that all these requirements can be satisfied by OLED micro displays. So how do we deal with that? We, we developed a method to uh, a path towards getting higher brightness OLED micro displays. So on the left is what I'm showing for our standard white with color filters, but color filters take away most of the light from the uh, display, uh, the emitted light. So it loses about 80% of the light. So that is what we thought we want to eliminate so that we can get higher output from the emitted light. So if you pattern the display, uh, the OLEDs directly into subpixels, red, blue, and green, then we don't need the color filter. That's one thing. And if you pattern it like this, you can also use phosphorescent materials, which are very high efficiency uh, as opposed to the fluorescent ones. So we, together with these, we get very high brightness actually. So this is just an example of what we built for WUXGA with our direct pattern. That's what we call as direct patterning, by the way. And we developed a WUXJ display with 9.6 micron pixel pitch. And we obtained about 7,500 nits maximum luminance. The subpixel active area was 1.95 micron by 7.8 micron. And these are some of the pictures of uh, the WUXJ display. And we also did a 2K by 2K display uh, using direct patterning and that one was 9.3 micron pixel pitch. And as I said, we obtained 7,500 nits full color. And our next goal in the near future is 10,000 uh, nits. Uh, so these are some of the future requirements of uh, OLED micro displays. And as I said, luminance is one of the key factors. And, uh, and once again, 10,000 nits is in the near future for us. And in the future, in the next two to three years, we project we will achieve close to 30,000 nits in full color with the OLED. And of course, high resolution, color gamut, REC 2020, et cetera, 
are very important. Uh, for many VR applications, the larger OLED displays are preferred, and then it leads to all kinds of stitching questions and all that. Power consumption needs to be less than a watt for most applications, and of course, the cost needs to be low. Okay, so uh, the conclusion is that high brightness OLED on silicon micro displays will be the technology of choice, in our opinion, in the coming years for both AR and VR applications. And lastly, I want to say that uh, the AR applications are not only for humans, the animals can use it too. And these are some military dogs that are using AR applications. And I find it very fascinating. And I think this market will grow one day. So with that said, I want to thank you for your attention. I hope I kept my time, I'm not sure. Uh, let me know. And any questions, feel free to ask. No, thank Thanks so much, Amal. Yeah, we have like a one or time for one or two questions. Uh, so there was a question about the amount of flux that an Imagine chip is generates to yield three thousand nits. How, how, what type? What amount of flux is required for three thousand uh, nits in your display? Let me see. Uh, do a calculation. I don't have an answer offhand. <laughs> we, we, didn't want, we need to put you on the spot. We can, it's okay if you want to, is it, you know, some really technical people in the audience, all different scope. Um, there's another the question. word is confusing me because we don't use that. <laughs> so we are into candela per meter square and uh, those kind of things. So I will have to calculate the flux. Yeah, he'll calculate the flux and he can send it by yeah. uh, email to yeah. you. Yeah, just send your contact, like your LinkedIn or email or whatever, yeah. and they can contact you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, and there's another question about, uh, are there greater differential aging issues with direct pattern color? I, I guess that means the lifetime of the display, but I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what they're talking about, but Stephen is welcome to uh, elucidate on that. Well, of course, as you know, that OLED displays do age faster as you drive it harder. And some of these uh, brightnesses, you have to drive harder. So that is a fact. Uh, but the point is that as you get higher and higher brightness, the device becomes more efficient. And so you can actually uh, operate it at a lower level and get enough brightness. But having said that, most of our customers have usage model. So what they have is, like I said, uh, persistence. If you have a 10% persistence level, you really don't need that high brightness all the time. So the average brightness comes down. Secondly, in video mode, it uses only Four, or 25 percent of the overall brightness and so uh, overall rather current and so that also helps so all these factors taken together the lifetime is fairly adequate uh, as we stand today for most applications awesome anything else it looks like that time. Uh, thank you, Amal, for uh, being here and everything you're working on is fascinating. So thanks again for presenting. You're welcome. Next up, Alex Brod, founder of Mousepack, will be joining us. We're excited to have him with us. He has worked in-house at various technology companies that you may use on a daily basis, such as LinkedIn, Snapchat, and Google. He's always been passionate about utilizing emerging tech to radiate joy and create a positive impact in the world, which is always extremely important. Alex also founded Mousepack, an AR animation studio, and he's working on some really awesome projects of which we look forward of seeing tonight. And before we get started, I uh, just wanted to note that Alex's wife is also named Alex, so both their names are Alex Brat. So it's Alex and Alex Brat. Seriously, same name. And they also have a puppy. Don't have info on the name, but maybe it's Alex too. And they live in Gramercy, Manhattan. So Alex, feel free to take it. Yeah, away. we're gonna name all our kids Alex too. We've decided it. So right. now the dog's name is Sadie. That would it's a right. cute coincidence now, but it'll be weird if we start naming our animals Alex. Well, let, us um, let me share my screen here and let me know when I'm good to go. Yep. Looks good. How does this look? Good? 
Excellent. Hey, so yeah, thanks for the introduction, Andy and Barry. Thanks for setting this up as well. Um, so like you said, I, we, I own a studio called Mouse Pack. The name is to kind of give off the feeling for all the mice that run around my house here in New York but also to show off like a small creative force coming together to create some cool stuff. Um, so my team, it fluctuates depending on the size of the project. Sometimes it's just me, it's more of the creative direction, um, all the way to development um, for various brands, marketing campaigns, um, and just, our, <coughs> excuse me, R&D work in general. Um, so I'm gonna show you a quick reel. It might not work uh, through the internet, um but if it gets choppy for you guys i'll send the link and you can watch it later but this will just kind of give you an idea for the type of work that we create So a lot of the projects that I showed off in there were R&D projects, which is the most fun work that we like to do. That's when we're in between working on client projects, we try to come up with creative solutions to tackle different problems in AR. Um, so the first one that I'm gonna go with, and let's see if I can, not a super, let's see if I can figure out how to get past this thing. One second. go there we go okay so the first one is sorry i got a lot of gifts in here so i think it's freaking out a little bit but the first one is for a project called inventor center this one was uh r d project for black history month we wanted to try to show how we can use ar as sort of an educational element this was targeted towards a younger audience my wife is a kindergarten teacher she uh, teaches in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. So they were kind of the target audience that we were looking at when we were creating this. Um, pretty much the whole idea was, how do we make history fun for kids? Uh, because history is boring, as we all know, everyone's dead and there's no iPads. So the idea was, how can we let kids interact with uh, various inventors um, throughout history? And we came up with this idea of showing sort of this this um sort of replica of each of their inventions so this one is lonnie johnson he's the inventor of the super soaker so this is sort of the the creative process that we go through for a project like this is we try to come up with some sort of visual language that we can use across the board so we try to look at what shapes are making up each like for example the super soaker here we had the concept artist come in and she just simplified everything into basic shapes, um, made a model for the characters, um, and then went ahead and we created it and implemented it in AR. So we have a few different inventors here. Uh, we just selected a few different people that had notable impacts on each invention. Obviously, we know as adults that, you know, an inventor is, is mostly, um, uh, an idea for children, but that was the idea is that to inspire them to maybe one day build their own products. So this is what it looks like. We have a little UI in the bottom. Again, this is mainly just for R&D. We're hoping one day to get this into something like AR glasses for a classroom or anything really. Uh, the next one's Spooky Smash. This was just to test what we can do with AR gaming with the hand tracking. This was done on an iPhone. Love to get this um, in AR glasses one day. Maybe we can use some of the, the cool tech that we saw earlier. Um, just giving you a breakdown into the concepting of it. A lot of it is just sitting down and deciding like how this game is gonna work, what's it gonna look like. Uh, originally we were gonna have uh, you know, a crazy pumpkin character that was pulling pumpkins off of himself and throwing them and he had to smash them back at him and destroy his armor. But again, this is R&D, we're not getting paid for this. So we decided to reuse assets. Um, and that's what I did on this one. So I had this old project and I recommend any creator do this to save time. If you have an old project that you're not using anymore and you can repurpose assets,
go ahead and do it. Um, we took this little tombstone that I created for some meme um, that we created a while ago and just threw it in Cinema 4D, just yeeted this little uh, pumpkin guy at it and just had it explode uh, to make a satisfying hit, a smash, if you will, um, for the user. So we played a little bit with, um, you know, it's a cartoon, obviously, so we didn't have to worry too much about realism, but we wanted to make the concrete feel natural in a way and kind of have it cave in on itself rather than just exploding. Um, so we found a nice happy medium where it has a little bounce to it, but it also has that friction that makes it feel concrete. Um, and then this is what it looks like in application. So if you don't do anything, you get attacked, you get the little claw on screen, and then if you hit it, it smashes and the number goes down. The idea was that you have to get through seven spooks, is what we call them, little spooky guys. Um, and then you win the game, and then it restarts and you play again. Um, the, the last one I'm going to share with you guys, this one was a weird one. This one was, uh, was a meme. I don't know if anybody knows about the Chug Jug with You song. Um, but this was a weird one. This is really fun to work on, and I'm hoping to do more stuff like this. So there was this song called Chug Jug with You, which is a reference to Fortnite. Um, for those of you uninitiated in the cult of Fortnite, Chug Jug is a healing item. Um, but it swept the internet, as you can see, like this song, just a blank song of people just listening to it, like nothing going on on screen. It had 21 million views. Um, we see Papa Joe over here singing to it. That was done by uh, Shmo Yoho, the Haji Kids, Haji Wife people. Um, so we had to get on this. We were like, okay, so I reached out to the creator and he, I was like, hey, I do AR, you wanna collaborate with me? And he was like, yeah. And we spitballed some ideas back and forth and he came up with the idea of creating a dance. Um, so that's what I did. So I thought of using the a body tracking system to have these characters behind them. So. The art direction is fairly simple. We took his logo, which is just this container of chug, which is the liquid that it's from Fortnite. Um, my brother and I play it every day. That's how I know everything about it. Uh, and he's a scientist. So video games make you smart. Tell that to your kids. Um, but pretty much his logo was just these, these glasses and then the chug. So we separated them out. I'm like, okay, the glasses, I know we got to sell that because this is Leviathan is his name. He's a streamer. He wears the glasses in his stream. That's his brand. The Chug is the Fortnite. So we came up with this sort of viscous character based on some of the, the characters that they've created. Um, from there, I had one of my developers just take a really basic, you know, 3D T pose of a character, chopped off his fingers, got rid of any facial features just to make him sort of viscous and blobule threw a bone rig in there. And then, yeah, and then Enoch, uh, he's actually in the chat today, got to work testing it out and his dance moves are unparalleled. So it was really to see if the system could keep up with Enoch was the test here. Um, but on the right, we have um, my sister-in-law's boyfriend is actually a professional Broadway dancer. And we had him create some choreography for the dance because uh, it didn't seem like there was anyone. If you ever go on like TikTok, there's like trends, like people do the same dance over and over again. So this was our idea of coming up with one of those dances. So he made one that was simple to use. Um, and then this is an application. Here's me doing those little dance moves. We try to add different sections um, for different parts of the song. So one part says like, just wiped out tomato town like move it a little gun. So I thought it'd be cool if there's like a bunch of little players. Um, and then, yeah, the other part, this is kind of like the hero shot that we're proud of is the, my friend just got downed. I revived him is the lyrics. And we kind of push this model into the ground and let him kind of like melt and rise back up. And this one was fun because it was, it was cool to see all the ways that people used it. You know, some people did the dance. Some people just, um, took videos of themselves in their car, like riding with the homies because they like the glasses. So it's cool to see where you concept it, where you come up with the idea for it and just where people take it. But anyways, that's me. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, Alex at mousepack.com. You can check out mousepack.com. We have a few more um, test videos on there, but we, yeah, love to chat. I love New York. I love AR. So hopefully I have some things in common with you guys. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. I apologize. Yeah. My, I'm 
I'm here with my kids as well. Uh, but uh, awesome presentation. And Thanks, if I had known, I would have had them uh, join in on your uh, violent Fortnite dancing. No. <laughs> um, so there was a relevant question about your wife. So maybe you want to answer on her behalf. Sure. Is your wife able to try Inventor Center out with her students and uh, follow up? And how, if they did, how did they react to it? So that's a great question. Unfortunately, because everything is virtual, it's kind of hard to get it in their hands. Um, my original plan was that we were going to send it to the kids and all the kids were going to sign in on their personal Snapchat accounts and use it. Um, but obviously, logistics didn't plan out that. I'm, I'm hoping very soon um, to get my hands on some AR glasses um, once schools open up and maybe partner with some of the education departments to see how kids actually play with these things. It's still, there's papers that are pro kids using AR and there's papers that are against kids using AR. So right now I'm just trying to come up with concepts and then I plan to try to test out the execution in the future. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely of the, of the disposition to have kids try out this because they're really digital natives and they're growing up with the technology. So why not use them as guinea pigs? But um, Amal did reference the like, human factors issues. You know, these obviously we don't know that much about, but um, you know, my kids are constantly on their devices, um, even if they do have in school. So, hey, if they can you try out a new type of technology, I think that's it's better than being on a, on a display, yeah. constant uh, the tablet, uh, whatever in their face all the time. Okay, and another pressing question I had was that Sadie in your videos with the uh, tombstone, just yeah. imploding tombstone. It was, okay, very good. Um, there was a question, I'm not sure who it was for, but maybe you can you can take this one. Sure. Uh, what do you think, uh, I guess, has made Pokemon Go so popular? And uh, where do you think AR is going in the future? So kind of an open question, but... You're right in the middle of it so you know what are your thoughts on that yeah so there's a few different factors i think pokemon go everybody points to that one as the big breakout success in ar and that it really was it was really the first time a lot of people quickly adopted ar uh, before that it was kind of a fun toy people would point at their business cards and see something cool come out um, but what i really liked about pokemon go was first the branding is impeccable obviously it's pokemon so they've been doing, they've been at this for a lot of years. They know how to make their characters look good. They know what type of lighting to use to make them feel robust, but also feel like they're part of the same family, which is something I try to do with my branding. Um, but also the social aspect of Pokemon Go was amazing. I don't know what everybody else's experience is with it, but I was in this sweet spot. Um, and I, I grew up in a town, Oxford, Connecticut. It's kind of a small town. And, you know, people go outside for not you know if they're going somewhere but that was the most people i've seen outside in like my entire life and people were just meeting up they're like hey what team are you on oh you're on this let's go take down a gym and they would like walk to some statue and there'd be like dudes hanging out in lawn chairs smoking hookah be like oh you think you could defeat us and it was like the coolest experience that i think shows you what augmented reality can do is augment your reality that's the point right it's supposed to take our world and make it better and not you know keep us in you know i mean video games are great obviously i play fortnite every day but you stay inside when you do that you know what i mean yeah it's excellent to to, to get out um here's a question from the audience sent to, to me uh and this will be the final question for you but we definitely love to have you back uh amazing stuff how long do you spend in concept versus design versus animation versus development in uh, unity how do you how do you spend your time and with your developers yeah, sure. So it really depends on the projects. Like I showed you a lot of R&D today, so there's no client notes on that. That's just coming out of my brain. And I probably spend more time on those just because I'm trying to come up with new mechanics or something different that I haven't seen before. Um, so, but I would say that, <laughs> eat it. Uh, I would say that most of- <laughs> I like say, to stick uh, food in my, yes. I would say, it's hard to tell it varies per project i will just say on these projects i showed you here it's probably a good 50 percent in the concept um just because we've seen that if we don't have that concept down we're just wasting time in development 
Um, and then these projects, I know they said Unity. We actually spit these out real quick in um, Snapchat and Lens Studio, just because it's very quick to build things and they have a lot of pre-built blocks for you. So this, these are prototypes. Um, so we, we try to spend, I, I would say it's probably like a, a third, a third, a third. So it's a third creative, a third in asset development, animation, and a third in the development of the coding. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, guys. Alex, for joining. It was great having you here and I hope to see you again soon. Um, and next up, we have uh, Chuck Alger and that'll be followed with a, uh, the Q&A uh, with Roni Avovitz. But Chuck, we are privileged to have you here. Uh, and another very impressive resume, uh, Chuck, Chuck Alger joined Kura in lead sourcing, supply chain, and NPI efforts as Kura is moving towards scale. Chuck has over 30 years experience spanning component manufacturing systems assembly, product MPI sourcing, supplier management and operations. Chuck developed and led international teams at Intel, Microsoft and Compound Photonics. Skilled in product development, such as Holland, Surface, Intel, Intel branded motherboards and a leader of manufacturing technology development for assembly and test for Intel TMG. Thanks for being here, Chuck and feel free to share your screen to present. Having trouble with uh, sharing the screen all of a sudden. Change the... Yeah, uh, no problem, take your time. Yep, and uh, just say to post your questions as you have them, and we, you can send them to me if you're shy, or you can just put it out there, and uh, myself and Andy will collate them and try to, to ask them to Chuck at the end. Yep, and uh, Ronnie's going to be coming on directly after for an open Q&A, so uh, feel free to prepare some questions uh, as you'll be able to ask them in person or in meta person. And it oh, looks like it's working. It's working. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Go technology. Sweet. Yeah. Okay. Sweet. Beautiful. Let me get to Yeah. So we haven't showed this um, this in too many forums until just recently. This is the latest instantiation of uh, our our. Uh, um, we're gonna we're using this as a vehicle to achieve uh, some pretty. Um, uh, compelling, um, you know, capabilities. Um, I don't have to spend too much time in this audience uh, talking about the use cases. I think uh, you guys have, you know, are familiar with these design uh, telepresence and and others uh, in in uh, the industry. Uh, you know, we see this this business. Uh, in, in this way, um, our focus is really going to be on uh, telepresence and training for obvious reasons. Um, uh, yeah, I, a quick comment. Uh, I'm sorry that, uh, you know, when you move the schedule, uh, uh, Kelly was uh, tied up and so wasn't available today, but uh, she's really a, the, the dynamic force behind this whole uh, activity. I recently joined about six months ago, and uh, I've been working in this industry for about Oh, going on eight, seven, eight years uh, at Microsoft and Compton Photonics. So um, I was really attracted to this uh, this mission where uh, she, yeah, our our first product is uh, has a 150 degree field of view. Uh, it's uh, lightweight. Uh, it we're uh, able to achieve 95% transparency, an 8K resolution, uh, very wide range of uh, uh, depth of field and uh, very high brightness. Uh, um, we're, we're able to do that through our uh, ge geometric waveguide uh, and, a, and a, you know, a custom set of optics. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a minute or a slide or two. Um, you know, 
the um, the industry has has some pretty substantial offerings out there and being part of some of the these things. I'm pretty proud of what we were able to accomplish up to now. Uh, but Cora has um, using the same uh, basic uh, camera setup is uh, is really pushing the the envelope. Uh, you can see the the lower um, images are are shot through our uh, prototypes. Okay. Um, I don't have to sell you guys on uh, field of view and how important it is to AR. Um, we're, uh, 150 degree field of view gives you a much more immersive uh, experience. Um, the this uh, structured geometric waveguide gives us a, a huge advantage in in uh, transparency and efficiency. Um, it makes it simpler to eliminate ghosts and the uh, and provide uh, you know high image quality. Um, we are using a, a very custom uh, micro LED display engine to achieve this. Um, the you know we. We can demonstrate uh, AK AR image uh, with uh, this technique and the large field of view. Um, we also have a very high tolerance for dead pixels in the uh, micro LED because of the way we're using them. And that gives us an advantage of using uh, micro LEDs probably sooner than a lot of people will be able to for uh, the, the typical uh, what we what we might call classical displays that are uh, going on out, out there right now. Um, the, again, this is a, a you know a custom micro LED driver, um, and it's compatible with existing manufacturing technologies. So uh, we think we're going to be able to bring these prototypes out and move through the development process in good order. Um, we do have a um, you know, a, a uh, alpha that, that we developed. This is not going out for um, developers or even for big big sales. We've got one specific partner that wanted us to do a demonstration for them. And uh, we're in the process of uh, getting those out the door. Um, well, again, I, I think that this is kind of reiterating a lot of what we already had. And since we've got kind of a limited uh, time. I, I really want to focus on uh, what we what we've been able to create with a, this high contrast ratio um, or this display is is very um, striking uh, uh, difference in display um, because it's because it's more efficient. We're we're getting more light to your eyeball. So um, we think this is going to be a, a really a, a game changer at some point soon. Okay. Um, again, just you know, comparing the the um, different um, offerings in the to to the product that we're we're, we're developing, um, we we need to probably update this because these guys have moved along. But I think that we're still uh, in every category providing some leadership. Okay, uh, this has an advanced uh, again six degrees of freedom. The the uh, we're providing a computer uh, vision SDK and a sample application. Um, should give us really good 3D visualization. Uh, and we'll have both untethered and PC connected operation. Okay. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're really focused on the um, display engine and, and then we're partnering with, uh, you know, many other uh, suppliers on uh, tracking uh, vision and uh, and some integration of the of these uh, technologies. Um, this is what our product plan really is about. Uh, is is targeting if we go forward on the right column, there are companies that and developers that that make their own software and their own applications, and then co also companies and users that are um, uh, working in the telepresence and collaboration field. So. Um, we're, we're focused on both hardware and software, providing a complete solution and and bringing this uh, entire thing to the market. Okay, um, this is our market projection and where we where where our cost and price targets are. 
Um, these are pretty aggressive compared to those uh, competitors that you saw out there. But we think that the um, simplification and the, and the focus that we've been able to do in, in terms of our optical display will give us this, uh, this kind of performance, okay? Um, the telepresence platform, uh, what we mean by it, because we get asked that, you know, um, there's travel, there's collaboration, uh, visualization of, of, uh, yeah, of design and, and then training and remote work. Um, these are, you know, um, areas where even Microsoft sees this as a, a huge market. Uh, they're tending towards more of the military and um, industrial for now. Uh, but we think that's mostly because of the cost. Um, we have met with a lot or you know, have active conversations with a lot of customers uh, who are interested in this. Uh, this gives you a pretty good set of statistics that uh, shows where where we think we are and and uh, uh, we have started to uh, receive some revenue for what we're doing. okay? Um, we've had some good uh, press about this, both from uh, you know a, a number of different places. Um, I think that you know there's there's really some opportunity here if we can uh, bring this whole thing together and make it uh, and get it into the market. Okay. Um, our current team size is about 24. Um, we're going to triple this by the end of the year. There's a huge hiring ramp in progress. There's uh, a, a lot of the normal startup it, uh, activities in terms of uh, fundraising and meeting with uh, um, investors and and you know uh, and customers. And uh, that's why Kelly couldn't be here today. Um, but you can see uh, this is starting to come together, and we've got. Uh, uh, pretty, we're getting to the point where we can call it critical mass. Um, I think that um, our focus and you know on on the platform is uh, is pretty is pretty um, I don't know exciting to work in. Uh, we have you know a lot of, a lot of things going on, and we're leveraging a lot of uh, what's happening in the industry and a lot of the stuff that you guys are doing in this forum. Um, this is where we are, uh, at least at this point, um, we've got a number of pretty significant accomplishments, uh, some good patents and uh, IP file. And we've just moved into our new facility here in, in February. And so we're in a position where we can hire some more people and uh, really uh, ramp up the activities, okay? Um, this is our goal. Our mission, uh, make uh, wearable augmented reality, um, change the way we work, play, and learn and connect. Okay, that's what I get. I'm, I think, uh, let's see, yeah. um, let, me, let me play this for you. This is a shot through our, uh, uh, our prototypes. You can see the active, you know, Moving images through uh, and and the various features that we talked about, we're still you know these aren't complete sets in terms of uh, stereo or whatever, but um, we are hitting on all of the um, the features that we have promised and and uh, are are working towards. Uh, awesome. The whole thing. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Really cool stuff. Good to see you making a lot of progress and even bringing in some dollars and that uh, Kelly is, is, is marching on. Um, okay, so we had a few questions. I think we'll just go with one. We could see that your prototype is full color. Um, so oh, they want to know what Kura means in, in Polish or they told us what's in Polish, but okay. They can ask you that on the side, so please yeah. post your your LinkedIn or email. Uh, oh, this is an interesting question about sound. I know some people have approached me about spatial type of sound, full sound, or uh, are, are you using that? What, what are you using um, 
in your device? Is it spatial sound or some other type of immersive um, stereo audio? Send me that question on the side, okay? Um, <laughs> okay, so that, that, that might be too. Yeah. Uh, you know, so well, you know, we we have a, a we have this solution that we're you know that are, is our first product. Um, behind that are you know at least one other and maybe two other products that are kind of on the in the conceptual stages and uh, so we expect to build this up into a platform that continues to mature and evolve over time uh, and so we're you know already looking at new and better display engines that are even more efficient um, that are more you know more cost effective and so on so we have a whole roadmap of stuff that that it's now not really appropriate to share, but we have a whole range of suppliers that we're working with. Okay. Uh, over cool. time. Well, I know you have a lot of connections that I feel from my uh, prior days at Merck. Um, and uh, we really are honored that you were able to show us this presentation. I guess one of the early people to see it. So uh, thank you so much for that. And uh, we look forward to hearing more good things uh, from you and your team. Have a great day. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. Good to have you. Now, without further ado, we are honored to hear, we are honored to have here Ronnie Abovitz here with us tonight. And the goal of this section is to have a laid back conversation and uh, Ronnie requested that I pause the recording to allow this part to be a little more candid. So let me just do that really quickly and stop sharing. Um, and I will. Um, 